Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Judy Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. Today on the podcast, we have Deanna Figurito, entrepreneur, consultant, coach, and creator of DFIG Connects. We speak to Deanna about the necessity for ERGs, employment resource groups, in building belonging, inclusion, and engagement. Deanna shares some stories of incredible transformation of individuals who have been part of the ERGs that she leads across the globe. You'll learn how powerful ERGs in creating a space for complete transparency and vulnerability a requirement for any business to succeed to Team Anywhere. Hello and welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere. I'm your host today, Mitch Simon, on the West Coast. And unfortunately, we do not have our amazing co-host, Dr. Virginia Bianco Mathis, on the East Coast. But today on the podcast, we do have Deanna Figurito, founder of DFIG Connects, a company that is offering solutions for strengthening culture in a virtual and hybrid world. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the impact DFIG is having on building engagement and empowerment through ERGs or employee resource groups. Deanna, so excited to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great, Mitch. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, great. Now, do I hear a New York accent? Because it sounds like you're in New York. Keen ears, I will say. Yes, I do have a New York accent. I Grew up there and built my career in Manhattan, but I actually am in Lima, Peru. Well, that's a surprise. <laughs> and how, how many New Yorkers are in Lima, Peru? I haven't found many. Maybe I'm the only one. I've been here for two years. I built my business all virtually from here. However, I do work with North Americans and Europeans. Okay, cool. Very cool. So what we always ask is our first question is, how have the last two years been for you and what has surprised you the most? Oh my God. That's such a loaded question. The last two years have been a complete life change. I quit my corporate job that I was working in ad tech in New York City and moved to Lima to flee the pandemic and live with my husband who was not allowed in the United States. So I changed my whole life. And then I launched a business, which is a passion and a total career shift, right? So I had a whole identity change of becoming a wife for the first time and also not being attached and identified with my corporate hat and my corporate job. So I think the question was, how has it changed? How has it been for me? You know, I think you should take the question wherever you want to take it. (laughs) Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Ginny is back. We are recording right now, Ginny. So welcome. Oh, great. Welcome, everybody. Nice to meet you. You too. This is our first time where we've just kind of introduced Ginny in the middle. All right. I love it. Back to the question. Your life was, you know, turned around in New York, Lima. It's all the same thing, right? And what we wanted to know is, you know, how have those years been for you and what has surprised you the most? Okay. So what surprised me the most? So the last two years have been transformational. I guess that would be the best word I could use. Mm -hmm. And I completely changed my life. I flipped the script. And I started a new life, essentially, the new career, a new husband, a new country, a new business, and now a new baby coming along. (laughs) So that's coming in June. And also I changed my life. I changed the way that I approached work. I changed the way that I ate and the way that I approached people. I became a coach. I changed the way I approached communication. So transformational. And what surprised me the most was the goodness that came out of something so bad, the pandemic and how awful it was for people and how hard it was personally for me to be in a new country during that, where I felt really alone and didn't have my tribe. And then the rest of the world who suffered immense grief, but so much shifted, like with, for example, the great resignation and the way that people were like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to stay in this bad relationship with my job, with this boyfriend, with this family member, and being able to shift based on looking at what actually matters in the world. And then the second thing is being able to be completely virtual. Like I built my entire business with the United States and Europe from Lima, 
completely from Lima. So that was really surprising to be able to watch the world shift into like what actually matters and also being able to be a completely virtual play. Like most of my contacts and clients that I work with, I haven't actually met them in person. Wow. Of all the folks we've talked to, you have might be the one who overturned the most. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you. It was a big change. And I'm coming out, like, if I talked to you a year ago, it would be a different conversation. But I'm really coming out feeling good. You talked about transformation. And obviously, there's a lot of physical transformations in many ways. And what do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned or strength that you've come away with or knowledge or wisdom? that, you know, you can kind of share with our audience. Okay. Let me try to say this without being cliche. Yeah. Probably that rejection is redirection. It's not necessarily, you know, this like failure one and two, your life is really determined by the way that you handle the hard things that come at you because you could wallow and be super sad or you could redirect and make it fabulous. So with all the changes that happen to you, You can take them and you're in charge of that. So like in coaching, the way that I was trained, we have your leader within or your intuition or God or whomever you follow from within you, whatever you want to call that. And then you have your inner critic. So the saboteurs and self-sabotaging behaviors that are not your story, that are not you or thoughts that could potentially control you. And for you to be able to recognize the two and recognize and control the inner critic and listen to the leader within or the voice within you and redirect that obstacle or whatever it is that seems like a trauma and make it into the life that you want, it's available to you. So that's like the biggest lesson I learned. How'd you build a company in Lima, Peru? I mean, again, you left New York and you become a coach. You launched DFIG Connects. How did you make it happen? Sure. I had the wherewithal to file for my S corporations, you know, actually the legal admin stuff when I was in New York. However, I could have done that virtually as well. You really Mm -hmm. can. And I started kind of acting like a freelancer. So I went from over the past year, I've had the business for two years. The first year I started as a freelancer and the second I became a CEO, I would say. And you know that feeling of like when you're kind of just figuring it out and you're taking these contracts and everything's reactive? The second year, I really put a plan into place. So I would say the first year I did it without knowing what I was doing. I just forged forward and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And I guess this is what I have to do. I joined entrepreneurial groups. I leaned on the SBA, so the Small Business Association, which the United States offers, and then New York State and New York City, which was my network. I leaned into that to see what was around SCORE mentors. I leaned into my resources that were all available virtually because of the pandemic and networked a ton and put myself out there and kept telling my story over and over, probably to the point where people are sick of hearing. But when you are passionate about something or when something Like when you have a vision or when you're really doing something that's authentically you, people resonate with it and they want to talk to you. So I talked to as many people as I could. And when I was struggling, I leaned on my coach or friends and I told them I'm struggling. So I was vulnerable and was like, I don't know how to do this. If it was something as simple as making a hire, like I don't know how to make hires. I don't know how to do X, Y, Z, because I was navigating not just a new business, new industry, which is coaching, but also how to be an entrepreneur. Right. So I did that. And then the second year I shifted to becoming an actual CEO rather than just a freelancer. So how to build a team, how to scale myself, how to stop being the product and making my business the product so that I'm not always needed to release control and let go of some of the things that I'm not even really good at, so I shouldn't be doing, and I should be making Mm -hmm. hires for it. So analyzing what I was spending all my time on, what I was wasting time on, consistently networking because I love doing it. I could just do that until I'm blue in the face, and that's not always going to get me somewhere. And then making hires for the things I'm really bad at, and also making hires for the things I shouldn't be spending my time on because if after analyzation, I'm worth more than that amount. So using data. And shifting to a model and planning, big time plan. So having a plan in place and sticking to it and writing it down and telling people about it. So I'm accountable. I guess if I could synthesize it in one sentence, it would be, I went from being reactive to proactive. 
and I was really vulnerable and put myself out there. And you stepped into it, it sounds like. You gave yourself permission to reach out for as much help as you could get. And I love the part of your story where in this day and age, the help is out there. Thinking of this room of entrepreneurs I had to speak to in this county uh, a few weeks ago, and the same voice around, well, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. You know, And their list was very similar to yours. And yet, what's the difference between someone who's successful and not is everything you just said. Yeah. It can yeah. be done. You could be okay. willing to fail, like also to feel stupid. Yep. I don't know how to do this. Like, can someone help me, please? Because I don't know what I'm doing. And everyone thinks that everyone else has it together. Everyone thinks everyone else knows. And it's like, no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> yes. yeah, that was beautiful. I just don't know how to do this. You know, So many people, I want to have them listen to you. Yeah. Well, sure. everyone should listen to this podcast. Yeah. yeah. This is a fun... I, I told... Um, I told Deanna when I met her last week, like, wow, amazing human. Love you. Okay. So on our intro call. He's going to um, adopt you. I'm going to adopt okay. you. Yeah. I'm coming to Lima right now. <laughs> on our intro call, what I was intrigued with was the impact you're having with your ERGs or you've had with your ERG. ERGs are employee resource groups. What is an employee resource group and what's your history there? Sure. So employee resource groups, they date back to the civil rights movement of the 60s or 70s, depending on kind of like if you read Forbes or HBR. But they started with Black resource groups based on the civil rights movement. And they're within an organization fostering community and shaping strategies for representation for underrepresented people. So they could be anything from Black, Hispanic, women groups, disabled groups, indigenous peoples, and their employee-led spaces for safe, honest interactions to lift voices and give employees who might feel disconnected a sense of worthiness. They're utilized within organizations for engagement and representation. They're actually becoming an integral part of organizations as Gen Z comes further into the workforce and the millennials get a bit older. They're now mm -hmm. expected and now they're a source for recruitment as well. And they're giving orgs a competitive edge if they have them. So from a corporation standpoint, they're much needed and they're used for retention and attrition strategies. And from an employee standpoint, they're used to make the employee feel included, have a sense of purpose, which we know leads to higher productivity in organizations and retention, people wanting to stay there and feeling valued. It also gives them something to do outside of their daily routine and to have leadership opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. If you look above you and you have a C-suite that's all white males, how can you feel like you can lead if you're a woman or a person of color? So they initially went from like social networks to actually professional development networks. And mm -hmm. now they're impacting businesses from a business standpoint. I would encourage all companies to form them, to find out about them. And often companies have ERGs, but the employees don't necessarily know that they exist. Mm -hmm. So I think the second part of your question you asked, how did I get involved with this? Often I lean toward working with women. So I get pulled into employee resource groups as I am, you know, I help to empower women in my work. And I also had a penchant for working with women because I started an employee resource group at the tech company I worked at two jobs ago. So I looked above me, I was in the process of freezing my eggs Aww. and I was like, Hey, HR, do we cover this? Is this covered in benefits? And they said no. And this was trendy at tech companies at the time. I knew Google did it, Pinterest did it, all the fan companies did this. So I kind of brought that up like, hey, you're going to attract talent. We need this. The women are aging and we need to be able to offer these kind of things. You know, I got a no as my response. But in response to that, I was like, hey, C-suite, hey, white men in the C-suite, <laughs> where's the representation? Where are all the women? So once, you know, I was denied the egg freezing, which I didn't expect, I figured that I can make change to come. So I pitched to the CEO and the C-suite, the CFO, and I gave a pitch about how, you know, basically 
supporting women makes a company more productive and results in more revenue. You know, I played to the purse strings and <laughs> I got a $30,000 fund for us to start a women ERG at that company. And then I left. <laughs> I left the company because <laughs> I got recruited by Pinterest, which was my most recent organization that I worked for. But that's where I started. That's where I knew, okay, there are these women groups. I could start one. They started it. I left the legacy behind. And now they bring me on and contract me at a company I used to work for to help build their ERG. So that's the oh, ERG perfect. I've been working with. Yeah. And multiple tech companies have brought me on to help build their ERGs. So I learned about how to start one and why it's important and also how to play to the C-suite to be able to get one and then start to bring the benefits to the org and make it an inclusive culture for everyone. So right. that's how it started for me. That's great. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of ERGs that you're working with right now so that our listeners can get an idea of how it might work? Sure. So the one I was just referring to, this tech company, it's very interesting. I'm working with the women's ERG. And what I like about this is that it brings the North America teams and the India teams together. So in tech, especially when you have all these extroverted salespeople and marketing folks that are women often, I'm using sweeping generalizations right now, but basically the marketers and the salespeople are the North Americans. And then the Indian team is software backend. So software engineering, eng, all of that. And they're more introverted, right? And they don't have this like representation. So what's really interesting is being able to bring those teams together when they wouldn't otherwise be brought together in a rooms, quote unquote, because this is a virtual room, there would be no water cooler chatter. So now you actually are opening up a safe space for them to do that. And that's been really interesting. It would be the same way that you would build out a leadership program. So group coaching, workshops, breakout rooms that now we're talking about virtual. So breakout rooms, buddying people up, putting them in a buddy or mentorship system, and then one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So those are the modules I would use in a leadership program anyway, but opening up that safe space and allowing you to say what it is that you need to say has really come forth in terms of building clarity and connectivity within organizations. I've had that feedback from these groups. Like, I didn't know that everyone around me felt this way. Totally. And the learning that has to be happening because I get to hear women from India or women from wherever outside of what just I know here in America has to be incredibly powerful. Yes. It just goes beyond just the topic. Almost. Yeah. Like when we were working on um, the month of March, it's International Women's Month. So a lot of companies have owed homage to International Women's Day, March 8th. And when we were working on this with LG, actually, they were talking about how women in India don't often have as much of a voice as the North American women. And that's cultural, right? They're not going to mm -hmm. speak up as much. So how right. do we do that? How do we encourage that? And what can we find out? And it's been just absolutely eye-opening. And then when you buddy and pair people up, that you wouldn't otherwise have been paired with. You're going to pick someone maybe that looks like you or does the same job as you, but we don't in these situations. And it's so rewarding. So you're talking about total different life perspectives and that can really help to grow and change an org. And it also means as a coach, bringing how you might go about coaching that kind of situation is delicate. Yes. Um, and I'm going to talk to you separately because I do want to put this on the table to show you the dichotomy of when you do a group like this. I had the president of an Indian company, and his wife was in the group. She's a major player in the organization. He wanted me to coach his wife on the side to convince her to get out of the business and just stay home and have babies. And okay. exactly, that's what I did. <laughs> She just covered her face, right? And boy, did I have to think that one through. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. So I'll talk to you separately. Wow. And that's ethical. You know, that's the ethical piece of right. me. You're yes. a coach. You're not there to convince someone. You're there to hold space for them to totally. do what you want to do, right? Yeah. Totally. Ooh. What are some of the results that you've seen with them? What are some of the insights the North Americans on your calls? What are you seeing? Are they getting greater understanding? Are they getting greater camaraderie? Are they getting greater courage? Yes. So I've seen all of that. So increased vulnerability, increased connectedness, and then increased engagement, mm -hmm. which leads to higher retention. 
So we have an 86% attendance rate, which is high for our workshops, yeah. our orgs, and our modules. 95% of the corps ask for repeat business with DFIT Connects. And the retention during the workshops, the drop-off is really low. It's like 80%. So the engagement is really high. And the org likes to see that. And the clients of these ERGs and people that have experienced it have reported more clarity and support and expressed a sense of feeling seen, heard, and a sense of belonging. Ephemeral feelings, I guess we could say, do lead to increased productivity and essentially intrinsic motivation, mm -hmm. which as coaches, we know increases productivity at an org. So I don't want to use just buzzwords, but Intrinsic motivation is the idea that someone, for those of you out there, that someone does this because they want to do it. So they're working because they want to, not because they have a metrics over them. So when we're increasing the intrinsic motivation, that means they're happy and more engaged employees are going to be more productive and they're going to stay at their job. Can you share with yeah. us like a story of one of the women that you've worked with? You must have like a great story of someone who got promoted or became more courageous or moved to Lehman, started a family. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably from a corporate standpoint, not the best story, but I would say <laughs> lots of times when I work with these women, they leave their jobs. Okay. So, right. um, <laughs> so I would say it was a woman that I worked with at a women's ERG and she left this role where she was leading up the ERG and started at a new corporation. I'm not going to say what it was for privacy issues. And within three weeks, she called me and we discussed and she was like, I made a huge mistake. Ah. I should have never moved here. This is not in line with my values at all and left, which is such a hard thing to do when you made it. Like she was at a pretty big tech platform mm -hmm. and she quote unquote made it. So she left this other org where she was a leader to go where she was, you know, a little fish in a big pond. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that didn't align with her. It was the incongruence with her values at this org. And for her to be able to have the confidence to realize that and turn and walk away was spectacular. I was right. so impressed with her and I was so proud of her. And now she's taken on a new role at a different organization that she's thriving at. But watching someone notice right away and be so aware that they entered something that wasn't congruent with their values and have the courage to walk away, even though you made that step, I think was a real success story. So really um, through these ERGs, which you wouldn't normally get in a, a corporate setting, people who participate are getting self-confidence, self-awareness, greater perception. Yes. And perspective um, and a caveat, because when I gave my particular example, I was using that as an example for... These folks are coming together and they can be from anywhere. I had used India. It could be Egypt. It could be down the street USA. Mm -hmm. It's a particular culture they've grown up in that could be conservative, that could be just the opposite. Right. And I'm just thinking of one woman who said, all I want is to convince my husband to let me drive to work. And it was amazing the group did help her, and she came in once into the group and said, I have an announcement. I can now drive to work. Wow. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> and that's so humbling. Like, look yeah. at what we take for granted in certain other cultures. A complete caveat from that, last week was my husband's visa appointment, mm -hmm. and we went there to try to get him back into the United States so we could bring the baby there and move there. Yeah. And there was, like hundreds of people on the line and I'm thinking to myself talk about perspective like all these people come here every day from different yeah. countries 200 consulates to try to get into the United States like you know non sequitur but that example really puts things in perspective and that's what these ERGs allow they're bringing people in from all different places but you ultimately have that one underpinning that you're a woman that you're indigenous that you're LGBTQ, all of those things that you have that connection and you can give different perspectives to set the stage and let you know what other people are dealing with and really right. build empathy, which ultimately we just want to be seen. We just want to be heard and we're all humans and this is a human experience that we're experiencing. Well, thank you, Deanna. Can you tell our listeners if they wanted to start an ERG, obviously they need to talk to you about it. So how can they find you, contact you, learn more about you? Sure. So you can head to my website, dfitconnects.com. 
or find me on Instagram at dfitconnects or send me an email, deanna at dfitconnects.com and reach out, set a discovery call with me and we can set up time to talk about building an ERG in your org and bringing us on potentially to help contract and build the ERG with you, offer workshops, offer the modules that I said. And we'd really walk you through the ways to kind of start it. And it's really three main things. Get buy-in from senior leadership, raise awareness about existing ERGs internally and externally, and recruit members who know what healthy ERGs look like. So like tap into people that already have them. And we can go deeper into it. I'd love to chat about it. And please reach out if you would like to do that. And one final connection, how powerful this is. You know, this is a podcast on team anywhere. And we can talk to leaders and they will share, here's how I empower my team. Here's how I pass on the culture. And what you have been speaking of is a whole other level of these cross-functional support and productivity that leaders need to be aware of and open to when they're approached. And supportive of. Yes, totally. Exactly. And also noticing that it keeps people connected. You want to talk about remote work during the pandemic. ERGs became the metaphorical room where people could work on their relationship with colleagues. So it was critical during the pandemic. And let's keep that going because it's critical moving forward. I think moving forward, we're not going to see organizations without ERGs as millennials age and Gen Z comes in and force. They expect it. Totally agree. Perfect. Well, thank you, Deanna. This has been great. I am so glad we connected. And for our listeners, you just got to talk to this woman. She's amazing. She's brilliant. She's the hardest working woman in Lima, Peru. And now in (laughs) America, let's just say, I really enjoyed meeting her. Thank you, Ginny. And thank you to our listeners. Please, if you've loved this podcast, which I have, share this with your friends, your family, your colleagues. And we'll see you next time on our next episode of Team Anywhere. (laughs) 